Hi, I'm Christopher Warnock of Renaissance Astrology. Today I'm going to talk about practical considerations in asking horary questions. This is for querents, but also for astrologers. Um, and I think that it's just, you know, horary is really different from natal astrology. You know, I think that you, you, we're dealing with both, you know, the difference between modern and medieval renaissance. Modern is much more psychological. Uh, the medieval renaissance is much more concrete, and that's going to be true whether whatever type of, of the astrology within that you're talking about. And then horary is really different from natal. Um, with horary, you know, essentially it's sort of like a microscope. You're getting this very, very focused, detailed uh, information. Natal is like being at 30,000 feet or having a really wide-angle lens. You've got this extremely broad perspective. Uh, if you think about it, think about relationships. If you have your natal chart, every single relationship you've got in your life is going to be in that natal chart. Okay, So it's not going to be able to give you very much detailed information about any particular individual relationship. If you ask a horary about it, you're going to be able to get some very detailed information about the particular relationship you're asking about, but that's it. It's not going to tell you about anything else. So again, that's something that, you know, it's, it's just it's kind of grasping that is difficult for people. The other thing that's difficult is that I think you know, most people are coming out of a modern perspective, which is very psychological. So it's very much of how you feel about things, psychology, whereas horror is very much yes, no, concrete, you know, black and white. And again, that can be, I mean, I think people like it. I mean, I find that clients really, really groove on a uh, horror once they kind of get the hang of it. But if you've had this, you know, introduction to astrology, you know, which is basically going to be modern natal, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to get used to the differences in some ways because you're already set up to the, the modern style. Not that that's wrong, it's just this is a different, it's, it's a different tool. And one of the great things about medieval renaissance is we've got a lot of tools in our toolkit. Got lots of different types of astrology, and we also have lots of different techniques that we can use for them. So we actually have a really full, instead of having just like a screwdriver, we've got a whole panoply of different things that we can work with. The other thing that I think is really interesting about horary is it really puts the you know, kibosh, so to speak, on the the whole energy or beams uh, causality of astrology. I mean, natal, you can kind of see how that, well, you're born at a certain time and there's beams coming at you at certain angles or something and they did something or other and that that's what causes it. Horary, I don't know how you could ever think of it being energy. The time of the question gives it the answer. How do beams work with that? I don't, impossible. What horary shows us is the cosmos is so patterned that the, a leaf doesn't fall without it being within the over, overarching patterns that, that are uh, going. And this, this, the cycles in heavens, you know, the cycles of the stars and the planets coincide with the, the, the underlying cycles that control the things on Earth. Everything fits together. Everything works. Everything has a meaning. Now, we don't know what it is necessarily. But that's the, that's the overarching uh, realization that you get from... I mean, I, I got it after doing about 500 horaries. I'm like, wait a second. It really blew open my whole view of reality. So again, that's one of the things about that's really useful about horary. Being so accurate and being so precise as well, it shows you that this stuff really works. It's not metaphoric. It's like it's very, very accurate. Um, so w when you look at horary, again, one of the things that people get a little confused about is the whole use of significators. And so like, well, Mercury, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like Mercury or the planets, what I look at them in a horary question is basically like a repertory theater. You've got these seven actors, the seven planets, and they can play 12 roles, those 12 houses. Any of the planets can play any of the roles. And so they just convey the meaning for the question. So you're not going to be able to say, oh, I had a horary about Saturn in the seventh, so Saturn is permanently have something to do with seventh house for me. No, it's just for that particular question. Um, so, um, again, something people get confused about. Horary is also interesting because it's very uh, much a slice at, the, at this particular moment. Um, and you don't want to move the horary chart, you know, too much forward or too much back. I mean, you might want to look like, for example, if a plant's just about to go retrograde, okay, that might come into consideration of it. But if it's talking about three weeks from now it's going retrograde, again, you're not going to be moving the chart forward. It's not like a natal chart that you do all sorts of techniques on and you do timing techniques and you compare current charts. So horary gives that, answer that question just using that slice. Um, and... Um, so another issue that people get into that's confusing for them is the, the what do we use as the time of the chart? I mean, the birth is birth charts, again, are a little bit illusory 
and that there's sort of like a fixed time. One of the problems with fixed chart, uh, excuse me, with natal charts is there's this whole idea of conception. I mean, isn't that the beginning? But you can't figure out what that time is. Um, so, and, and it comes up in electional, like what's the, you know, people say, what's the right time? I have to use incorporation. People want to use incorporation. Well, there's lots of possible start times for a business. You can see the incorporation time, first sale, you know, when you first open your doors, when you announce it, lots of possible. So, so that's one of the things about the, the birth time is that seems really obvious. Even that's complicated because what if they get it wrong? What if they're five minutes off? You know, in Indiana, they were using Central Time versus Eastern Time, blah, blah, blah. All sorts of complications about that. What if you don't have your time? So again, it's sort of illusory to be focusing on that, you know, really fixed, obvious time of birth. Um, so the, the question with the horror is, you know, when's the time of the question? Because that's what we're using. With the, the time of the question gives you the answer to the question. Again, crazy, but it, it works really well. Um, so a lot of times, querents kind of wonder. The querent is a person asks the question. They're like, "Well, we should use the ask time. It's my question. So use my location and the time when I ask the question." What well, Lily, uh, who's the, probably the most famous Hori astrologer, uh, 1647, is Christian astrology. He says, "I use the time when I understand, receive, and understand the question." So he said, "If I get a letter." I break it open, I read the, 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 the letter, and then when I understand the question, I use my time and date and location for it. And th the difference here is that what's happening is that really it's you've got to complete the question is how I would look at it. It's like a confession. You're not really making the confession until you, you, know, you actually state it to somebody, like you say to the confessor or the police or whatever whenever you're doing the confession. The question is very much like that. You could be, have been thinking about this question for a long time, but, you know, when, so then what, what's the time of the asking of that question? Or you've been thinking about it repeatedly. Um, and really, it's not your question, okay? It's the cosmos' question. You're playing a role in that, right? You know, it's the, you know you're kind of completing the circuit by asking the, by asking the astrologer. But ultimately, this is a universal cycle, and you're attuning to it. And really, one of the, the ways you, the, the way you attune to it, and the way you know you have a good question, is it's important emotionally to you. I mean, that's really the question, the, really the, the issue is how important is this to you? Relationship questions, for example, are great, super juicy. People care a lot about them, very straightforward questions. Uh, I really like doing relationship questions. I get a lot of them, probably more than anything else, relationship questions. But that's the key is it's got to be an important question to you emotionally. And I think that's also one of the reasons, I mean, I've never been able to have much success on using horror astrology for like stock trading or foreign exchange or crypto or whatever kind of financial shenanigans people are up to. And I think part of that is because the individual trade is irrelevant. I mean, people could care less what's happening. They just want to make the money. That's where the emotion is. And so I think you could ask, will I make money from, you know, my financial trading over the next year or whatever, but starting to ask about, should I buy this stock or that stock or foreign exchange or whatever, like I said, whatever the flavor of the month, the crypto token or whatever it is, never seems to be that effective. Now there's, an infinite number of people that want it to work, and there's an, a lot of people that will sell you their system for financial astrology. What I always ask is, if this is such a great system, why are they selling it? All you gotta do is take that system and make a billion dollars off of it, and you're set. If they're selling it to you, it must not be a very good system. But logic, again, goes out the window with this sort of situation. People wanna believe in it, and therefore they make, you know, they, they, they put themselves in a situation where they, they get conned. Um, so um, when we think about the types of questions that are appropriate for horary, one of the best things that you can do as far as sort of focusing yourself is to think of, is, is this a yes or no question? Because if it's a yes or no question, it's giving us a very, we're limiting and we're making a precise question. We're giving a precise um, you know, area to look at that allows us to get an accurate answer about it. Really need to have a single outcome. So if you're saying, should I do X, Y, or Z? Again, you got multiple outcomes. And again, it gets, it gets sort of hypothetical. Another one is, if I do X, what will, will, I, you know, will Y happen? Again, it's much too hypothetical. It needs to be a concrete, solid question. And part of it seems to be this idea of, you really haven't, I and mean, this is how I've thought about it, you really haven't committed to this future until you've actually you know, got to the point where you're asking a concrete question. If you're still at the hypothetical stage, if a lot of stuff hasn't flown around, then in a sense, the future hasn't firmed up enough, you know? If you think of the alternate, all those different alternate paths you could take, 
um, you haven't got to the point where you're really ready to talk about it. Again, the level of emotion about it needs to be there. The level of focus needs to be there in terms of precision and the fact that it's not, not hypothetical as a single outcome. Like all these things need to come together to make it a real enough future, so to speak, in order to ask a horary about it. Now, like I said, typically you want a single outcome. One of the major exceptions to that is, you know, X or Y is stay or move. You know, sh should I stay where I am or move? And you can, you can, you can, has lots of variations about it. Um, the, um, but you can do that because the fourth house is the current location and seventh house is the potential location. So you can, you can, you got two separate houses. But if you say, should I move to Boston, LA, or New York? Every one of those, Boston, LA, LA or New York, would be, would be signified in a horror chart by the seventh house. Can't tell the difference very effectively. Um, now, maybe people can try to do that. And maybe they'll get some kind of more psychic, intuitive thing about it. Oh, that shows, you know, that Aries equals LA or something like that. Very difficult to do that. Um, the more complicated the chart is, the harder it is to get an accurate answer about it. Uh, so generally what you need to do, like I said, is to, to come down with the, with, the, with the final answer. Now, one of the things you could do is if you're trying to choose between two things, one possible way of dealing with that is to uh, just ask separate questions. So say, should I move to Boston? Then move, should I move to LA? Should I move to New York? The problem is really you're kind of in the same topic. And the more you start nibbling around that same topic, the more you're likely to get contradictory or confusing answers. I mean, if you sort of get, you can sort of say, well, Boston is the best and New York is not so good, but then you can't, I can't tell the difference between, you know, LA and New York or LA and Boston. I don't know how to choose between those. Again, that becomes confusing. It's one of those things about asking horary questions. Another practical thing about that that kind of fits in here is this, you can't ask the same question twice. Now, I don't think that's really true. What I would say about it is that if you ask the same question, quickly after asking it the first time, you're probably asking because you want a different answer, right? Or you're so stressed out about it or anxious about it that you're just, you know, again, you're not really asking a serious question. You're asking for reassurance or whatever. The other problem you have is that you get a contradictory answer, you know, and that's the one that typical nibbling around the edges, you know, you start asking about different aspects of a, a situation. So technically you're not asking the same question, but you really are the same, the same underlying question which is what I would call the root question. And it's always important to ask the root question if you want to get an accurate answer. Um, so, um, you know, again, a classic one would be a relationship. The person doesn't want to ask the root question, which is, will I have a relationship with this committed relationship with this person? So they, start ask, they ask, will they call me? Will they contact me? When's the next time I'm going to hear from them? And this, this, is, this is a safe question because if the answer is yes, they'll contact me. They can go, oh yeah, I'm going to have a relationship. It's positive. If they say no, if the astrologer says no, you're not going to, they're not going to contact you. They're like, oh well, it doesn't mean I'm not going to have a relationship. And so, really, you know, the root question forces you to really come to what are we really asking about. So it's useful from that standpoint, and also facing the possibility of getting a no answer. And I think this is one of the most difficult things for horary, is that. Um, a lot of times, astrology is used as a means of reassurance. The same thing with any kind of divination. And people are asking the question because they want basically to feel better about it. They don't want a no, a no answer. I get this a lot, for example, with will I get a job? Or, you know, when will I get a job or will I get a job? People have been out of work for a long time. They're freaking out. They need that job really badly. When am I going to, you know, I'm going to get a job, right? And my job is, my, my job as the astrologer is to come back and say, okay, everything's going to be okay. The problem is, is that horary is accurate. And so I come back, I do the horary, which is, again, say looking at, say, 12 months. That's use, That's another thing about the precision of horaries is that they're able to be so precise because they're not, again, they're looking at a limited time period. I typically figure out looking about 12 months. So you're not going to get a job over the next 12 months. You know, is that going to help you? So I'll ask people that. I say, if you're going to ask that question, are you ready for a no answer? And that's something you always have to be ready with the horary is that if you ask it, you could get a yes or you could get a no. And really, I think this is one of those important things about any kind of divination. You got to respect the oracle, you know. And again, respecting the oracle is the recognition that again, you're not in control. It's not for reassurance. I mean, you're actually. I consider my clients to be very brave to be willing to ask a question because they're willing to have a no answer. They want to know what's going to happen, whatever it is, whether it's yes or no. Um, 
And again, that's what I think one of the great things about Hori is, is that it's a predict, it's an actual predictive mechanism. It's not a, it's not a means of of, of uh, reassurance or, uh, you know, like hindsight looking at Hitler's chart or something. Not predictive. Um, so again, when you talk about the root question, this is what we want to focus on. Um, and so the. The search for the root question is useful too in the, in the sense of like a lot of times when people come they've got this complicated situation, a lot of stuff flying around and Hori really in a sense forces you but also helps you to sort through that because what you need to do is rather than having all these issues flying around you need to kind of break things down and go first things first. What really needs to be dealt with first? Um, I had not too long ago someone asked me the question they just emailed me, and because I don't want a lot of subsidiary extra information, because I'm just I don't want to be reading back what people told me to them. I just want the basic questions so I can orient myself for the chart, and then we can you know add into that later. But anyway, the question is, will we move? And it it I, you know I did the worry for them, and so the situation turned out to be that their spouse's job was tied to the location that they're at, and it's a very bad job, and the person wanted the spouse to change jobs. But so they wanted to know if they would move because the only way they were going to move is if they left the job. So therefore, if they would move, then they, they knew they would change the jobs. And I was just like, ugh, you know. And, and they were kind of thought, well, this isn't quite answering my question properly. And I'm like, well, because that was not the root question, you know. Really what you wanted to know about was, was my spouse going to change their job? And so that would have been, that's the root question. Um, and like I said, the other the, the the root question in terms of relationship stuff is again something that that people they don't want to bite the bullet on, or they want to kind of dodge around the edges of it. Another thing people will do is they'll ask a question, and then they're still worried about it. You know, the question didn't quite you know do it for them, so they want to ask again. And like I said, they come at a different angle, or ask about some subsidiary issue or something like that. Again, once you've asked that question, you really want to stick with that question and not try to overturn it or whatever. One, from a sign of respect, like I said, for the oracle is a basic thing, and two, because of accuracy problems. Now, what you can do is if the situation changes, you can ask, or you can wait a reasonable amount of time. I mean, a week later is not enough, typically. But like I said, you know, if six months later you want to ask again, a lot of times you're going to get the same answer, you know. And, you know, that's what the, th the thing with the 12 months is that it's not as if, okay, after 12 months, all of a sudden everything changes, right? It's just that that's as far as the horror is typically going to look out. Because if you think about it, and if I asked a question like, will I be successful as an astrologer, when I first started, it would be like, you know, no, 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 sort of, yes, yes, yes. You know, it's like if I asked one horary, it would be very difficult to get that, you know, that, that complete answer out of it. it would, but it would give me an accurate answer for, the, say, the next 12 months, you know. And you can ask a time frame. I mean, that happens a lot of job questions. People are like, will I get a job in three months? You want to use a natural time frame. I kind of prefer to do the 12 months in some ways, but you know that's you know because that, it's adding another wrinkle into it. What if you get a job in six months, and you ask if I'm going to get a job in three months? It's going to say no. Again, that's adds a certain amount of complexity into it. But that as long as it's a natural time frame, that's something you can use in the question. Um, another issue that comes up is a lot of times what I find with querents is they invariably assume they're in complete control of the situation. They have total choice of what they're going to do. And the, the horror that I've done, maybe also becoming, you know, the, the, the life experience is the recognition that we're really not in control of a lot of situations. So when you ask, should I, that assumes that you're in control and can decide. Again, usually the root question is, will, will, will I or will X happen? Now we can look at that, like, should I, should I take the job, you know? Um, we can look at the, like for a job question, like say the, you're the, the Quarant is the first house, the job would be the 10th house and employer. If we look at that and we see that there's a connection between the first ruler and the 10th ruler, or the, you know, there's a connection between the Quarant and the, and the job, say, so yeah, you can get it. But then you look and you notice that, for example, that the ruler of the 10th is afflicted or, you know, the, um, the first ruler representing the Quarant is in the 10th house, but is afflicted, for example. You can say, you know what, you can get the job, but it looks like it's going to be a bad job. Maybe you don't want to do it. So that, that can be, you know, that can be useful, and then you can take that into consideration in terms of it. With job questions, it's interesting because, you know, oftentimes, as a practical matter, I'm saying to people, like, you know, even though it looks like a bad job, do, you know, can you really afford not to take it, you know? It's like, oh, well, I don't want this a bad job. What are you going to live off of, you know? And it's easier to get a job if you already have one. 
So I, I've had a significant number of circumstances where I've said to people, you know, it doesn't look like it's such a great job, but, you know, maybe you should take it anyway, depending on your circumstances, you know. And, and so, again, horror is super practical. Practicality has to come into it. And my judgment and experience is enhanced by my life experience as I, as I look at these. Another issue in terms of this control or timing or whatever comes with this idea of when. So, and, and to make this really obvious to people, like say, if I ask the question, when will I become president, right? Well, that's assuming there's, that I'm gonna be president, just with when, it's gonna be next, it's gonna be 2024, 2028, you know, when, when, am, I, when am I gonna be president? It's like, you're not gonna be president. Um, so you can ask, uh, you know, like I said, will I get married and if so, when? That's possible, but you always got to recognize that it may not happen. Yes or no is always possible. You can't control the outcome of events by controlling how you ask the question. So timing also is very complicated in horrors. Um, there, there may be a situation where there's no timing indications, so we're not able to do any timing you know, of, the, of the outcome. Also, when the timing indications are, are confusing or they're just not accurate. I mean, I'm, ha I'm usually happy if I get the headline yes or no question, uh, if I can get that right. Timing, I think, is a bonus, you know, and, and so that's, you know, this expectation, again, some, with some people that, you know, we have an absolutely clear, totally accurate view of reality, you know, what's going to happen in the future, it's not possible. There's a, it's actually incredibly difficult to do this accurately. I mean, the fact that it works, it is kind of amazing, um, and, but that's a combination of the, the strength of the technique and then the quality of the astrologer, their experience and intuition, everything that goes into it. Another problematic type of question is a how question. And again, it's assuming it's possible and it's assuming that, you know, there's got to be a way to do it. You just tell me, the chart needs to tell me how to do it. Again, may not be possible. And again, the control and ability we have over this the situation may be limited. It's like oftentimes it's either going to happen or not happen. Um, and we just don't have the control. So how questions, again, are, are really not doable. Um, so I, I think that's sort of helpful in terms of thinking about a lot of different practical issues in terms of framing the question. A lot of it comes down to breaking things down and attacking the situation in a in just classic problem-solving manner. And, you know, and not having a million things freaking out and flying around in issues, but what really needs to be dealt with first. Like I said, you know, uh, you know, will I get the job in Paris? It's like, wait a second, are you even gonna move to Paris? In fact, are you even gonna lose the current job? I mean, we have to deal with stuff first. You know, can you can you even move to? Is it even possible to move to Paris? Is that is that doable? Uh, and throwing all this stuff together, you know, get you know, got to break it down. Like I said, work through it in order. And the really, you know, why it's possible with like I said with Hori to ask, you know, A, B, C options. Go, will I do A? Will I do B? Will I do C? Really, the best way to use Hori is to go through your normal decision making process, bring it down to a final decision as far as you know. This is what I really want to do and then use Hori to confirm that. That's gonna be the most effective in terms of getting an accurate answer. Now, sometimes, you know, you're not, you're at the beginning stages of the, of the, of the process, and, you know, you're not able to ask that kind of question. Then you gotta recognize that the Hori may not be as accurate, or may not even be able to ask a Hori. You're too, you may be very well too early in the process. If you can't ask a yes or no question, you, you can't use a Hori for that. Because the thing about it is, is that horror does not exist to just do whatever you want. I mean, it's, it's like saying, you know, why doesn't my car, f you know, fly? It's like, because cars don't fly. I mean, horror is incredibly helpful, incredibly accurate, but it only does certain things. And, and you know, the accuracy stuff, the, 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 how accurate it is. I mean, for example, if somebody came to me and said, am I pregnant? Really, you should go ahead and do a pregnancy test. I mean, you've got a scientific very, very accurate, you know, uh, test that's going to tell you very clearly whether you're pregnant or not. That's what you should use instead of horary. It's not accurate enough to rely on for that. Again, another issue that comes up with that is like, is, you know, is my spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever cheating on me? Do not like to do that in a horary question because that, you know, then you're going to confront them based on an astrology chart. It's not accurate enough you know, to, for people to go up and, you know, like I said, the consequences that happen from it. Now, I have it, I have, what I'll typically say is if I, someone asks me a relationship question, like, are we going to divorce or something? There are indications that are provided, like I said, in Lily's Christian astrology, as far as whether they're cheating on you or not. What I always say with that is to say, look, you need to have information outside the astrology reading to confirm this before you take any action based on it. And you can't confront the person based on it or get angry about it or do anything about it 
just based on a on a horary chart. It's just not accurate enough. It's you know too too much of an, an outcome. And and it's interesting because just in relationship questions as general, I mean, what do you do with these? I mean, if I had a business deal and I did a horary and it came up negative, it's interesting. I just re recollect one where I where I said to the person, I said, "This partner is not what they appear to be. You know, they're not going to be able to follow through on their end of the deal." And the person came back to me and said, oh, that's ridiculous, you know, that's just not true. And then about six months later, they came back to me and said, you know, you're right. You turned out to be correct. That person just didn't follow through on it. So a business deal is much more, you know, objective, so to speak. I mean, it's you don't have an emotional attachment. I mean, you maybe want to make the money or not, but you just don't have the same emotional attachment you would have a relationship. With a relationship question, if somebody comes to me and says, will I marry X? And I say no, usually they go ahead and try anyway. And I think that's perfectly reasonable. What I think the horary does there is not say, oh, well, I'm not going to even try with a relationship because the horary said no, so I'm just going to give up. That, that doesn't seem to be really to be the approach that would be appropriate for something like that. Instead, what you can do is, to, you know, don't bet your farm. You know, don't, don't, don't sell all your assets and move to, you know, like I said, move to Paris just because of the potential relationship, especially when it looks like it's not going to come, come through. Uh, but I think it makes sense to go ahead and try anyway with the recognition that it may not, it may not be successful. So again, lots of complications, but lots of useful practical stuff to think about in terms of how this works. Um, and ultimately the decision is the, the clearance, you know, what they're going to do with it. I think it's what I get nervous about is if someone comes to me and they're like, oh, you decide, you know, the chart's going to decide for me. I'll let them do everything. I'll do whatever you say. I don't like that. I mean, really what you want to do, I think, is to say this is one piece of information in the puzzle. You know, I've talked to a lot of people, I've got a lot of advice, I've thought about it a lot myself, and I did this horror reading, it all kind of fits together, I'm going to follow that course or whatever. And I think that that's, you know, that's the, the rational and reasonable approach to how, to how to use the horror. But I wouldn't want to be, you know, basically anyone's relying on this 100%. Because, I mean, it's not 100% accurate, you know. I mean, I could, it's hard to put a rate on it. I mean, it's certainly more than random chance. I mean, the number of times I've been able to nail stuff specifically is kind of incredible. You know, who knows what the, I, mean, I don't think you'd really quantify it. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is amazing how some often they'll nail it and how, you know, how often you get the stuff right. But it's not 100%, not 100% by any means. Any more than an economist is or a doctor is 100% of their diagnosis. Uh, but I think it's worth, like I said, it's worth taking seriously, thinking about it, but adding it as one piece of information into the mix. And if you decide to go against it, you know, maybe, 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 if it's, maybe, you will, maybe, maybe it's wrong, you know, maybe this, because I've had situations where I've misread the chart when I went back and looked and said, oh, I can see how this came up. But I've also had charts that just didn't fit the situation. You know, that happens as well. So, you know, and the, what, the way I would account for that is this, is that, when we're talking about celestial cycles, it seems to me that what we're looking at, it's a bit like the electromagnetic spectrum. It's almost like we're looking at the, the, spe the band of visible light because that's all we can see. You know, it's, it's basically from, um, you know, purple to, to, to yellow in that spectrum. And so you've got ultraviolet light, infrared light that are outside the spectrum we can't even see. And like the bees can, like flowers, you know, they have colors in them that we can't even see. So... When we're looking at the astrological cycles, we're only getting a limited number of the of the complete spiritual cycles that are going on. So stuff's happening that's outside of that, you know, those cycles. And there's and there's miracles and stuff. I don't think I think miracles do happen, you know, out supernatural stuff. It's outside the 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 realm of normal causality. But I also think there's a lot going on, even in normal causality, that we can't see, we're not aware of. So again, not the all-seeing eye. There's somewhere in between the you know completely fake the skeptics and the complete credence, you know, 100% accuracy that some people seem to think that that it has, which it, which it clearly doesn't. So ultimately, I like I said, I think I love horary. I mean, it was my first introduction to astrology, really. I mean, I, I read a few kind of nibbled around the edges of a few books, but my first training was uh, with Carol Wiggers and then Lee Lehman, you know, as a horary astrologer. And so that really had a, a major impact on on my astrological practice. I mean, even when I do, um, you know, for example, electional is very much, you know, the sister of, of horror astrology. Even when I do a natal chart, I have, in a, in a sense, a kind of a, a horror approach, a, a lily style uh, horror approach. It had a huge impact on my uh, worldview because when I recognized that horror actually worked, it blew up this idea that there's nothing except matter and energy. And it 
recognition, and it wasn't even spiritual energy, the fact that everything was so patterned that horror could, the only way horror could work is if everything sort of fits together it was really revolutionary for me and had, has had a huge impact on me. So I really enjoy doing horror questions. I've done probably about 5,000 horror questions for clients. And every question I've ever done, I do it in writing, so I keep a copy of it. And then when I get back feedback, I have a file that's got, you know, feedback, you know, positive or negative. I mean, it's about 10 to 1 accurate versus inaccurate. It's not, like I said, not 100% accuracy, but generally the feedback is is, is good as far as the, the accuracy. Um, so, and I, again, once people understand what you can do with horary, they really, they really go for it. I mean, the fact that you can get uh, an accurate answer to a yes or no question, um, you know, really a very precise, focused answer as opposed to the sort of natal can be very foggy and particularly when you're talking psychological natal, you're not getting a very concrete uh, answer out of it and often may or may not be accurate, depends on the astrologer. So I'm very enthused about horary. But I think these issues are useful to think about both for the, the querent and the astrologer. Ultimately, for an astrologer, you really have to be as objective as possible for the, to answer these properly. Uh, Mr. Spock is kind of you be archetypal, you know, uh, horror astrologer. Um, and you really cannot be worried about giving people no answers or you can't be influenced by the client's desires if you want an accurate reading. I mean, essentially, at, at, right at the beginning, I made the decision I wanted to be accurate, which means I, ha means I have to give people a lot of bad news. Uh, and that's also why it's difficult to answer your own question as a horror astrologer. I mean, you can ask the question, uh, but you need to be very emotionally involved in the situation to ask it. But then to judge it, you have to be very objective in order to answer the question. And then also you have the asked versus the location of the astrologer question. The asked questions seem to be possible to do that, but they do seem to be influenced subjectively by the desires and emotions of the, of the querent, such that they're more, if someone wants a particular outcome, that tends to, to uh, you know, show up in the, in the asked chart, whereas, it, whereas the received chart, the chart with the astrologer, tends to be more objective. But it's interesting with the negatives. You know, I take a certain, I've taken a certain amount of flack, I mean, about my horror case, but for example, someone was complaining about it. it's got, got lots of no answers in there, as if that's the astrologer's fault. Um, and I think that really reveals a lot about people's expectations of this, the astrologers do. Their job is to say yes. Their, jo their job is to tell me, you know, give me what I want. It's just not, not going to be possible in reality. I mean, you can, you can go ahead and compromise yourself and tell people what they want to hear and make them happy, and then you know, six months later they don't get it, and then they're unhappy at that point. Um, so my preference has always been to try to be accurate, um, and to, but that means you've got to be willing to give people a, a no answer. And also to face it for yourself if, that's your, if you're going to ask the question in the first place. Uh, but I think ultimately, you know, it is extremely useful to understand the future. And if you don't want to know the answer, that's perfectly legitimate too. You don't ask the question. Um, so, but you just don't want to get these mind games of like, you know, changing stuff around or asking a bunch of times or, you know, messing with the chart or whatever like that. I think it's, like I said, extremely difficult to, to judge your own question, even though that's why a lot of people are doing this is just to do their own questions. A strange perspective for me because I just don't, you know, if I have a, I mean, also I'll do a lot of I Ching stuff just to get kind of a, you know, a feel for stuff, but I don't typically do a ton of worries for myself just because, you know, like I said, either I don't want to know the answer or I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm feeling confident about, you know, the way that I, I really have a sense of faith, you know, in, in, in the underlying, you know, the universe. Um, and so, but it really is an excellent tool. And when I do have a serious question, you know, that Varen said, I definitely think that horror is an excellent way to go. So I hope that's helpful and useful. Lots of stuff in there, um, but the practical, and this is distilled from, you know, 20 years of practice and study, like I said, over 5,000 horary questions, uh, and I really do enjoy, it's probably my favorite reading to do as a horary, you know, I can really sit down and really, you know, click into the, the, the chart really quickly and, and, and give an answer, that's, that's very satisfying for me, and I think it's very helpful for my clients. So I hope you find that useful. And um, you can see links in there for uh, you know my main horary page. And then if you want to you know ask a horary question, what I ask you to do with horaries is to send me the question first, or contact me to help you formulate the question before you order. And that way we don't have a situation because refunds are complicated. I end up getting charged with the fees and everything. It's all messy and everything. Um, best thing to do is to get that question formulated first. Let me check it out. 
and then I'll send you the order link for that, um, and then you can you know do the whole question. Uh, so I hope you find that useful and practical, and I look forward myself to doing horrors. And then again, I have my also you can see a link there to my horror astrology course. If you kind of get, find this exciting and interesting to go ahead and be able to do it for yourself, I highly recommend the horror astrology course.